All right. Well, it's one minute after, so we'll, and I want to respect everyone's time, so we'll get started. Uh, so my name is Lindsay Corbin. I'm the coordinator for the Nova Scotia chapter of the Coalition for Healthy School Food, and my position is housed with Nourish Nova Scotia. And I'm excited to welcome all of you to Feeding 40 to 400 Lessons Learned from School Cafeterias. Uh, we cannot have meaningful conversations about school food and health uh, without first discussing our relationship to the land and water, which provides our nourishment. So I would like to acknowledge that we are in Mi'kma'ki, the unceded and ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, and I invite you to take a look at this uh, map and uh, view the different territories uh, and where you are joining from yourself uh, today. I am personally in Big Tuk, uh, and um, I know that uh, Mi'kmaq is a territory covered by the Peace and Friendship Treaties, and we are all treaty people. So if you uh, are a settler today here, um, as I am, I encourage you to take time to consider uh, how we have benefited from living and working on these unsurrendered lands and the commitments you'd like to make uh, in centering Indigenous school, uh, food sovereignty and other aspects of truth and reconciliation in your school food work. An exciting opportunity to do this is um, actually coming up in July. So uh, the North American Indigenous Games are being hosted uh, in Chibuktuk or Halifax and um, Nourish staff have signed up to volunteer and we would uh, love for you to join us um, as we support um, the five, well, we're not, not all of us are going to, we're not going to support all 5,000 athletes ourselves, um, but uh, we as a, as a huge team of volunteers will be supporting the 5,000 athletes from 750 plus nations across Turtle Island um, in a celebration of sport and culture this summer. So I um, would invite you to join us and I'll put the link in the chat. Um, also wanted to let you know that uh, we will be having um, taking questions so you can use the chat uh, box for asking questions as well um, throughout the webinar. I will turn it over to Lisa. Thank you, Lindsay, and it's wonderful to be here with you and to anticipate a conversation with uh, two school food leaders who I find very inspiring and insightful and just wonderful, wonderful resources. Um, so I'm really glad to be able to offer that. Just another quick note that um, staff are here to support you if you have technical issues. Um, so use the chat for that. And um, this session is being recorded and will be available on the Nourish uh, YouTube channel. So um, I'm Lisa Roberts. I use she, her pronouns. I've been executive director at Nourish for just about a year. Um, in a previous career, I was a journalist. Um, and so I love asking questions and, and hosting uh, these webinars um, has been a wonderful way for me to go on my learning about school food journey. Um, if you don't know a lot about Nourish, we are a, a charitable nonprofit with a vision of a Nova Scotia where children and youth are well nourished to live, learn, and play. And, and we work in partnership with communities and with schools. If you haven't already, please um, sign up to receive our monthly e-newsletter. Um, we're dropping the sign, in, sign it up link uh, in the chat. And if at the end of the webinar, you feel like you've gotten some value and you want to support our work, please consider becoming a, a monthly uh, donor or, or a one-time donor to Nourish. Um, monthly donors are really helpful in giving us some latitude to explore new ways um, that we can be helpful to our partners and to um, the healthy nourishment of children and youth. Um, so uh, it would be also, it would be really awesome. I see a handful of names that I recognize. I see a bunch of names that I don't, which is amazing. Um, it would be lovely to know who is with us today. So please feel free, uh, please introduce yourself in the chat. 
um, maybe share where you're joining us from or your connection uh, to school food. Are you a parent, an educator, a food service worker? Um, and I'm also going to drop in a resource um, if you'd like to see where you are um, in Mi'kmaq, assuming that you're joining us from Nova Scotia, or actually, I think the resource actually has Indigenous place names for, for maybe all of Turtle Island or, or at least um, those parts to the north. Um, I can share that I'm in Quebec or Bedford today. Uh, which is where the Nourish office is located for just another few days before we move to Dartmouth North. Um, so Nourish was a founding member of the Coalition for Healthy School Food, and we're dedicated to sharing resources, learning, and inspiration. And our guests today really deliver all three. Um, so quickly to introduce them, Indira Persaud is a Red Seal chef who entered the school food world at Gasparo Elementary, a school with 200 students that still has a thriving school food program. But then she followed her daughter to Kings County Academy in Kentville in the Annapolis Valley of Nova Scotia. On a typical day, she leads the feeding of about 300 people with the help of two cafeteria assistants. The, the cafeteria is PTA run and has been profiled on the website of Farm to Cafeteria Canada, and we'll share that link as well. And then my other guest is Jenny Osborne. Jenny is, uh, I think, a relatively well-known champion of, of both school food and local food. She co-owned and ran the popular Union Street Cafe in Berwick for many years and co-authored the Local Food Lunch Toolkit with kid-tested recipes um, for both cafeteria workers and for families, which is available on the Nourish website. And, and we'll share that link as well. Jenny has helped to transform cafeteria food in multiple schools, serves on the steering committee of the Nova Scotia Advisory to the Coalition for Healthy School Food, and this spring has been offering professional development to food service workers in the Tri-County Regional Center of Education on behalf of Nourish. And they're going to share lessons learned from feeding 40 to 400. So let's jump right in. Indira, can you paint a picture of success in the cafeteria at Kings County Academy? What, what does it look like and what does it sound like? Um, for me, the success, I guess coming from, this is more of a before and after scenario. So uh, basically when I started at KCA, um, I felt that the cafeteria was alienated. We felt there's a disconnect and um, I didn't feel part of the school community or the cafeteria. People would enter and didn't want to enter. They wanted to be very respectful of my space. And I'm like, it's a community kitchen. I always thought it's, it's part of the school community. And I just wanted to create that feeling that anyone's welcome. And if they need anything, we're here. I'm basically there for them. So I think, it's been four, this is my fourth year working at KCA school and um, we've had compliments, the school community, like we're part of the school community and it's, it's great kids, uh, staff, they use us as a resource. We're there. Yes, we're there to feed and prepare meals and stuff, but we're there for so many other things. And I think for me, that's a huge success because it's just, um, we all work together then. I don't think we can't achieve anything if we don't. So I think that was for me a really big, um, big success in that school and then providing our lunch program. So there's a lot of actual successes, but, but for me, that, that was a big one because that was the start. So once you, they could, you have that relationship and then the trust and all these other things kind of play and that, that seemed to and develop and it just, it just, it just helped in so many ways. So, um, so for me, that's one of the bigger ones. And Indira, because, you know, I've heard about Kings County Academy a bit. I've, I've called, referred to it as like the school food Shangri-La of <laughs> Nova Scotia. But just sketch, sketch a bit of the details in about what your lunch program looks like in terms of number of kids that you're serving, what that looks like. Yep. So um, basically we run a, a monthly menu and um, it's an online. So basically parents, families um, order their meals for that week. So basically a, a menu is posted on a weekly basis. And um, 
I have two other staff members. So basically on Sunday, we receive our orders, our numbers, and then um, I'm pretty much um, with those numbers. I just uh, prepare the meals for that week. And then um, I have a prep cook and I also have a big part of it too is the organizing of these students' orders and special diets or any um, anything that needs to be uh, jotted down recorded to help with the service so the big thing is because we deal with a large volume you need that flow and you're following a school schedule and it's very rigid and you have to kind of really set yourself up for that day so we have three lunch services so and um, the lunches are boxed and prepared so and I have someone up front Jocelyn who oversees that area and we have volunteers to help with the boxing of the meals and it's just from basically quarter after 11 till 1230, it's just go. So I'm there at 830 in the morning, 8, 830. Um, and basically I always work a day ahead. So I'm basically heating up the meal of the day. And then my prep cook, Julie, will come in and she's preparing for the day before. So we kind of work that way, always working ahead and making sure um, you're prepared for that day because there's really no opportunity to kind of fall behind because we just kind of run with it. So, and um, that's pretty much the run of a day. We do basically on average now, I'd say that we were doing about 300 meals. Um, I find with this online system that we have, I, I, it's, it's changed the numbers. Um, I find the numbers are higher now. And we also have a core group of students that are part of um, our lunch program. And we basically are also have those 40 students that are part of the school that the school, um, their names are given to us and we make sure those are lunches available for those students as well. So um, okay. that's, that's the day. Today I did wraps. I knew I had this webinar, so that's a grace day for us. So um, usually it's like a pizza day or kind of a fun end of the, end of the week meal, but um, sometimes it's nice to have a, a, a wrap day because you kind of don't have to worry about cutlery. You don't really have to, the cleanup is minimal. So it's just a bit of an easier day, which allows me to work on other things too. So, yeah. So Jenny, um, cycle menus, that a cycle menu, that's a term that is coming up a lot in conversations. And I wonder if, if you can share what it is and why why it matters that a successful school cafeteria is working with a cycle menu well it it is a tool not every successful cafeteria uses them um but it is something that i have found in the last couple of years uh is helping me to stay organized and make uh, a lot happen in a short time so it it's essentially um it's a tool to help with cooking and quantity and it can help ensure consistency. So it's really just a list of the menu items that you that work well at your school, but you're organizing them into two, three, four, even six week cycles. Um, and it's a little bit of a fun game, I find, to kind of like match up. Um, maybe you try to find like a unifying theme on on Tuesdays or um, you know, you're, you're making sure that you're adding a lot of variety and it's very easy to see at a glance that, you know, you're incorporating a lot of variety of protein or gr and grains and, and fruit and vegetables. So, um, for me, it's a way of doing the work once, not that you're going, not going to revisit it cause you are, but you do the work at the beginning of the year and then, then you just repeat it. So, um, we take into consideration things like uh, prep time, like on a Monday. And I feel like Indira is already giving you some hints, like a wrap would be a great thing to make on a Monday because it's simple and <laughs> and yeah. it's quick. Um, you know, something like a baked potato bar because it's, you know, very little prep time and then it can ease you into the rest of the week. Um, like I said, it's, it's allowing you to kind of look at a glance and make sure that you are included including all of those um, lovely fruits and vegetables that come into season and, um, and offering a wide variety. And, and over time, I think the beauty of it for me is that over time I can really track the numbers of participation for each menu item. And then, um, you know, that just allows us to, to prepare the enough portions. It helps us to reduce waste. And then we can really nerd out and, um, 
make like a weekly task list for each each week's menu and and even like our shopping list so just like a little um reminder about all the things that we need to have in stock it just you know it can really help to carve out time for making a whole bunch of um food from scratch yeah you we, we use them there and uh, yeah it really Sorry, go ahead, Indira, and oh, maybe no, you we, could also. We use, uh, yeah, I was just saying we we use um, Jenny's recipes from the food, uh, the toolkit, and it's um, it's great because of the quantities. Basically, it's a great. It starts with a minimum of fifty people, so it's a really good guide. So and um, a way of measurement, but also there's a flexibility in those menus. So um, or in the recipes like butter chicken or um, adding sweet potatoes or adding you can always increase the nutritional value in that item and uh so i really like that and it can be seasonal too so um so that, that, that's something that i just wanted to say <laughs> that i, I actually well, that's a, recipes. A thing sometimes people Sorry? Just will be more, or that it won't allow you to you like incorporate yeah oops am i picking up just a little bit, just a little bit. Maybe it'll give me a chance to to chime in with the next question because I found this with you two the other day that you can just go off of each other and I might not have a chance to ask a second question. But um, uh, Indira, you know, obviously schools and families are impacted as everyone is by the inflation of food costs as as you know, a lead chef for a cafeteria that's serving a lot of families, um, how do you ensure that you're 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 you know accomplishing what you need to accomplish and and like able to also feed your workers fairly? I know that you don't like really see the dollars and cents, but like what no. what what are the efficiencies that allow you to to be successful? Um. Well, I do tweak a lot. I am a tweaker in the kitchen. So extending meals, um, especially the protein, there are legumes which complement. So it kind of stretches. Um, but I don't, to, to be honest, like it's, I don't want to, I don't want to be restricted by that because it's so important to have the variety in the food available. But being realistic, but having more of a vegetarian option or having a soup option, corn chowder or something. So having higher items offset the other kind of thing, which are popular. Um, I do have someone that bakes in house. So a lot of the baking happens in house too, which kind of makes it more um, affordable as well. So just working around that. It, but I've also looked at donations too, especially um, in the summer, if I can. It doesn't, especially tomatoes or certain items, vegetables, or if I can freeze them and utilize them in tomato-based products and stuff like that, but those kind of go quickly, but it's a nice start. But there's a quite a different ways of going about it, but I really don't want to be restricted to that because of the, I know there is that issue and I've been, um, my focus is the food and creating the variety. And um, because there's also, I deal with the, pre-primaries and older kids, they kind of offset the, the food that you give and the portion sizes. I find with the younger kids, less is more. They, they You have variety, you have like a fruit veggie cup, you have that protein, but it's a smaller portion, but it kind of offsets and allows for bigger portions for the older um, kids and stuff like that. So kind of playing around with that. But um, it, it's just extending and adding either legumes uh, more, uh, like a, for a cream sauce, I add um, cauliflower, which creates, so you need less dairy. You create more of a creamy base. So you kind of replicate those flavors, but you have that as well. So um, that's what I, if that, if that makes sense, <laughs> that's kind of what I do. Um, well, but a, lo a lot of the, it, the cost, I don't let that, I, it's, it's, I'm aware of it, but it hasn't been brought to my attention to, to be really strict about it. If that makes any sense. Well, that's wonderful that you have sort of that support. And I know that part of what we've talked about previously is it, it 
it is easier to to do well when you're doing well, like like making serving volumes of the same successful meal is 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 more successful than serving small quantities of that meal. So, yeah, so success begets success. Um, Jenny, you've worked in in quite a few different schools. Um, can you can you talk a little bit about the the impact of the wages for cafeteria workers and and like the impact of sort of cafeteria workers often not feeling secure in their employment, feeling pressure to um, to sell meals or to make to make profit and how that can actually um, make their success more challenging? And I think we're seeing, um, I think we're seeing a lot of work and support um, gathering for this, but, and I think it's maybe the AG report kind of pointed to this, that um, you know, without sort of job security, there is pressure on, on schools to, um, to make a profit on the cafeteria, or at least, you know, break even, and that includes paying the wages of, of the cafeteria workers. So, um, and really, without them, there would not be any lunch available at school. So we need, you know, we need to, we need to have those folks. A complex job, it requires a lot of skill and good humor and patience and willingness to to grow and learn and you know be part of a bigger community. So um, I think you know, univer like I don't want to say anything is universal, but I, but sometimes I know that workers feel like they need to spend their time looking for discounted food. Or, um, or deals, and that might take away from time that they could otherwise spend, um, you know, cooking a higher volume of food. Um, and again, they might feel like they need to serve items that don't really meet the policy just because they're popular and they sell, and that, you know, that might offset um, higher costs of other foods made from scratch. Um, and also it's hard to find people that it's, uh, some, sometimes schools have a hard time retaining workers because um, or finding a sub to work when a worker is sick because there aren't some, um, you know, the, the jobs aren't necessarily high paying everywhere. Again, I thought it's changing. Um, yeah, and I think it's interesting, Deirdre said that earlier feeling of being a bit disconnected from the school community because I, I think that that's true that sometimes when a worker is not compensated properly it can result in a feeling of being undervalued and disconnected so and I think every cafeteria I work I met so far wants to do a great job and I do see a growing community of folks that are looking for ways to support that so I yeah I appreciate all of those efforts and I see a lot of them across um, the places that I've been privileged to visit. It's exciting. I see, um, I see that there was a question in the chat about the cost per, per meal at KCEA. And thank you, Jillian York, who uh, is part of the, the PTA that actually runs that cafeteria for responding to that. Um, the, the, your meals at the moment are $4, um, $4 a meal, which is, um, uh, yeah, kind of, kind of remarkable. Uh, I, I've been doing some deep dives recently into different cafeteria menus in, in Halifax and, you know, $7, $7 and some is, is the more typical price. Um, uh, Jenny, Jenny, you've been supporting recently some professional development at the high school level. And I wonder if we could just talk a little bit about like the different the how it gets to be different at that level at the high school level it feels like that's like extra challenging for a number of different reasons yeah so i think it it's true that maybe uh, elementary school for one thing the portions are smaller so it might you know it might just be that you know you can't push the price of the meal higher but it's definitely going to cost more um in food uh yeah so the other thing with high school is that you you need a grab and go option or two but i think sometimes uh high schools can get caught up in offering like something for every single taste and budget and um you know while we need to make sure that every kid at school that is hungry gets food when they need it um 
at the same time, it does, it can make it confusing and it can make it so that capital workers have to spend a lot of time managing a whole bunch of different options and uh, keeping them fresh and shooting for them. So, um, you know, wherever possible, I, I think it's great if schools can move to a one, one main dish option with a hopefully a vegetarian option and and other special diets um but yeah at the same time recognizing that there's lots of busy kids that need to pick up something and and run um and yeah i think that many of the dishes that work at elementary school can also work at, at high school and especially to think that like we're growing um, kids' appetite for these foods while they're in elementary school, and in a very short time, they're in high school, and you know, with, with the same taste and just a bigger appetite. In, Indira, uh, there was also a question in the chat, and Jillian has answered to some extent. But what are some of the most popular meals that, that you know of from the kitchen side and and how do you respond uh or or how do you gauge student feedback and and adjust accordingly yes that's for you indira and you're on mute at the moment oh here we go Okay, I didn't know that happened to me. Okay, so um, well, obviously pizza um, is a very popular one. And I would say up there is breakfast. Anything like an all day breakfast item is is uh, another one. And um, butter chicken, that's been huge. That's been a, a, a real um, surprise, but also um, I'm, I'm, I'm more varied something to kind of uh, something more ethnic which i like so but that's been very popular and um sorry what was the the follow-up so and, and how do i guess how do you how do you gauge student feedback oh, like how do you uh, respond the popularity of it um is our numbers are basically our numbers reflect so if i have a tuna wrap of uh, that's the numbers are quite low so that's kind of a reflection so what the item is or um the also by the compost, you look at what's waste, like you look at the waste. So um, I have uh, basically the, 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 the custodian there is, it's very helpful. Um, she's actually also a trained cook, but turned um, custodian, but she's very, um, she'll, she'll let me know. She'll just kind of have a peek and say that that wasn't a good one. That did not go very well. So <laughs> it's got input, but for me, it's the wastage. That's a, a, a big indicator. And, um, also the ease of the food and um for me it's like keeping a rule of thumb of minimum three items on the plate uh it's kind of like if it's too busy sometimes i find that it, it doesn't help but just keeping it uh that probably that, yeah i'll just say probably the biggest indicator is the wastage and and, uh, and the numbers of, of orders so um so i'll probably get about 200 250 orders of a tuna but you know pizza day is like almost up to 373 it's high and and we'll probably uh i have it next week i'm pretty sure it's probably over 300 or so so those are really good indicators another one is taco bar and our salad bar so those are another it, it, introducing the salad bar is really increased um interest so and it's more popular so that's uh like a taco bar we're doing next week so i don't have the numbers but i anticipate they're probably very high <laughs> But good. So, and and Jenny, I'll just note for you that you're on mute right now, and I don't I don't know if you put yourself on mute intentionally. Oh, she's not, yeah. She's now you're good. Um, let's talk a little bit about whether they're called salad bars or fresh food bars. Like you've also referenced a baked potato bar, and now I'm hearing of a taco bar. But what what is that kind of approach to serving a meal? And like, what are the unique strategies that you use to like be able to respond to that demand because i've heard different things about it needing extra hands and extra prep or is it is it easier because you can prep a lot of it in advance so maybe jenny first and then indira you can chime in jenny uh, yeah i think that the salad bar was you know, in a um 
product that I undertook at my son's school, like, I don't know, I think it was seven years ago. And it was just so ridiculously popular and changed the attitude about what the main meal was because we incorporated it into the meal, the main meal. They almost didn't care what the main meal was. They just were interested that they could, you know, have, add their own fruit and, uh, you know, bits and pieces of vegetables or maybe customize their main meal with, um, you know, with taco toppings. So just that feeling of autonomy, I think, for kids uh, is fantastic. And it's almost like, um, yeah, it's, it's hit. That being said, it is a lot of work on the back end. And sometimes they go through an unbelievable quantity of, of food. So it can, you know, that can mean having a, a person, an adult there who is helping, you know, um, make sure the kids are getting what they want, that they're being reasonable and learn those lessons about sharing, um, <laughs> making yeah. sure they have to go around. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I think they're fantastic if you are able, to, if you have the time and that it can be part of um, making a really a bit nice variety of, of foods for kids and if you can't do it then a, a nice fruit or vegetable side is always you know is always great too. And Dira anything you'd want to add based on your experience is it extra challenging or just extra successful? Oh I would say both it's definitely a lot more prep you're dealing with a lot you're dealing with basically raw produce which needs to be cleaned prepared properly and then also serving them and also the cleanup is another big factor it does take a lot longer um, because we have now two salad bars so it's just a lot more of um, uh, the cleanup part of it we're noticing but the other part is it's nice to have that type of variety to complement we do like a chicken pot pie or something and I guess it's going back to autonomy is basically the child gets to choose what they want which is great and um, so, and it, you have variety, color, and um, and they kind of create their own their own meal to complement their whatever they're eating. So, and some get adventuresome. Or what I like is this idea of communal eating and seeing what your peers are, are eating. And they, I think that's learned behavior they see, and they may try it. Well, I've never tried a, be a pickled beet, but you know, it's in the salad bar. They might try experiment more. So, I kind of like that. And um, you see the variety, all the plates are different with kids. They like fruit, they definitely love, love fruit. So I've learned to create more, put more fruit available for them, but more variety, but it's, um, it's very, there's a lot of excitement too when the salad bar comes up, when it's salad bar day. So it's, 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 it's definitely appreciated. You can see it amongst a lot of people there that, it, that eat there. So it's like a pizza day, they're like excited, so. And I too try to mix it up a bit. So there is a bit of variety. So we added um, like adding edamame or something like that. So, you know, some kids might be, some might, I don't know, but they know that some of them put it in their mouth and it's not, you know, you gotta take it out of the pod like a, you know, so it's kind of learned too. So how to eat a soybean and they're grown in, and I know I see them grown in the Valley. I don't, they're not, they're more for, um, I think agriculture for food stock and stuff, but you do see them in our Valley. So you see soy grown. So it's kind of also good to have have things like that, that are in our community. So for them to sample. Uh, that brings us to, um, well, for, first of all, let me say, I'm trying to see chats and Jillian's doing a great job of answering some very specific ones related to KCA. So thank you for that. But if people have other chats that they, or other questions that they'd like to ask to Indira and Jenny, do, do start putting them in the chat and I'll do my best to ask them. Um, but Indira, maybe you just mentioned local food and you are you you are both located in the Annapolis Valley, which for anybody from outside of Nova Scotia is the sort of primary agricultural region of Nova Scotia. So uh, in some ways that gives you advantages that there are more farm markets, there's you know possibilities of developing more relationships directly with producers. Uh, but what is your experience of, of the challenge and the advantages, I guess, of incorporating local food intentionally into, into your recipes. 
And maybe Jenny, I'll start with you though. I'll say your 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 internet is a little less than ideal. So how about if I start with Indira and maybe you have more than one more than one option that you can click on your computer and it might help might help with your audio a little. So yeah, Indira, yeah. over to you first. Um, so basically my food, uh, my produce um, that I deal with, my uh, delivery or my provider, um, they deal with a lot of local. So I kind of, I like that. And I, I express an interest that I'd rather see more local produce um, mentioned to me when it comes in. So, and it's nice, there are a lot of greenhouses. So what's available a lot year, year round is great. The, and it's things that children enjoy, the cucumbers, the, uh, the cherry tomatoes and stuff. And um, so I can get a lot of that in good quantities. And also our breakfast program, it's nice to source out apples. We have a lot, all those things too, which is great. But my biggest thing with the variety too is the quantities because I need larger quantities of item. It's really hard. I know that farmer, has something like maybe the asparagus that I'd love to support, but it's just getting those quantities for what we need in our, our, our for our kitchen. So it's a little challenging, but um, there are um, places that I'm becoming more aware of and that I would like to, to support is, um, I know the Wolfville Farmers Market is supporting, is having a, a delivery for food service and as well as I think the station hub. So I'm just kind of right now in the process of kind of learning a bit more and seeing how those, those places can complement and be more um, local oriented in our kitchen. So there is a lot of there, it's just kind of sourcing out. And for me, the legwork, I kind of did a lot of that, but I want, I would like the, everything to kind of come to us instead of me going to them. So just to make things a little easier. And that is being more, that is being um, recognized and it is happening, which is awesome. So I think probably, um, I would probably see even more local produce. Um, even microgreens a provider though, we've had uh, education and kids and I, having more microgreens too, which children enjoy or pea shoots and stuff. So um, through farm to cafeteria, those produce are introduced local and then incorporated into our salad bar, incorporated into our menu. So that helps too. So it's kind of nice when they become more self-aware of what's grown in our valley or grown in Nova Scotia or locally, it's uh, the appreciation and awareness and they, they seem to enjoy it because it does local does taste better. So, <laughs> so and Jenny, I see you've gone off video, which maybe means that we'll hear your beautiful voice more clearly. What what would you say about uh, about incorporating local food and about the, some of the challenges that maybe you've wit witnessed in in other locations? Like I know you've been spending some time recently in Tri County, where there's maybe a little bit less easy access to, to delivery of food? Maybe, although there are, there are produce suppliers that, um, that do service most of the province. Um, so that's a plus. Um, I think to, you know, looking, looking to menu items that sort of naturally incorporate um, the local bounty. Um, some, sometimes they're, foods that we think of as traditional to Nova Scotia, but, um, but also, um, you know, that a, a big variety of, of uh, menu items that you know, incorporate turnip and carrots and potatoes and things that are, um, are relatively inexpensive and do offset um, our menu costs. Uh, obviously, we have um, some access to locally grown meats and things like that too. So, but yeah, I think it really is designing your menu um, to incorporate those, those foods from the very beginning rather than looking, you know, and I guess that really does mean cooking from scratch in a lot of cases, because that's how you're able to utilize, um, you know, those local items. But I, I really appreciate what I said too about, you know, we do need um, the delivery to come to us because, this, all this procurement can take a great deal of time, especially if you're thinking about, um, you know, trying to prioritize local in your school and and shouting out to parents about that and to the wider community, because I think it is a great marketing tool as well. Um, but yeah, it, you do need it to be delivered to your door because there is not a great deal of time when you're focusing on cooking, <laughs> especially can appreciate Indira, you know, cooking for 300 people. She's not got time to run around and and stop at every farm so i love that um, hubs are developing and people are thinking about ways to make it possible to 
um, yeah, to make it easy for people to get their hands on it. Thanks, Jenny. And you are quite a bit clearer when we when we don't also get to see you. Um, I I'm, I want to ask you, Jenny, a little bit more about you know starting on the journey to success because really like where Indira and KCA are feels like a long way a, a long way down down a path from where some schools and some school cafeterias are now. And I know that you have that experience of like kind of starting to change the menus and starting to promote a new a, a new menu in a cafeteria. And what are the what are the keys to success in in starting out on that journey? I think um, it's asking you help. if you're you know, if you're a cafeteria worker, you're going to need increased time and you're going to need um, the support of as many people in your school community as possible. Um, you know, where it comes to marketing and and promoting the cafeteria within within the, you know, in the classroom or, um, you know, maybe having some local farmers contributing to your school lunch program. You know, you really do need help. Um, and that might, you might start off slowly, like adding a salad bar to what is existing or even adding a daily fruit and vegetable side to what's existing. And um, I think, you know, fear can really stop us or, or this fear that like kids aren't going to like it. They're, they're, you know, they, they wouldn't possibly try this or they won't, you know, and, and that's hard because we, as cooks, we want people to like our food. So it's, you know, it is scary sometimes to try new things. Um, um, I know one fun thing that we've been doing at Big B High School the last few weeks is uh, a Try It Tuesday. So we're getting out um, just little samples of, of m new menu items that we're trying, um, handing those out at recess and just getting some feedback on what kids think about them. You know, instead of expecting that you know, they're going to come on down and, and put their meat on and buy it right away. Um, so and I think that's a great a great idea is to, you know, but in any services to be able to offer samples kind of on the spot to any kid who's lunch workers. Um, you know, that's a, that's a big commitment. That's like, that's my lunch money. I don't want that to disappear <laughs> and have it and not like what I'm going to eat. So, um, but yeah, I, I think starting off with even just something like a salad bar, asking for help to try a new menu item, asking family in the school community if they can come in and um, share a new recipe and, you know, to share with, with the, um, with the school is, those are all great ways to kind of increase interest in, in what's happening in the cafeteria. And also like Indira was talking about earlier, connecting the cafeteria workers to the rest of the school community and making, you know, making that room or that kitchen, like just part of the public space in the school. Indira, I know that in the Valley, there is this farm to school snack program. Do you see connections between that, like the fact that kids are getting to sample fresh vegetables that maybe are new to them, uh, and then some of those same vegetables are appearing in menus uh, or in, in the meals at the cafeteria? Do you see that, that connection being important? Oh, for sure. For sure, because I think it, 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 I don't, if you're introduced to one item from what I learned is that you may get it, they may be less reluctant to try it, but I think if you keep trying more than once or reintroducing items, you almost, it, it becomes, um, it almost becomes a norm, but I find doing that, re repeating items that were introduced is really important. I think with kids, you don't want it to be a one-time thing. You want to Maybe they will try the red cabbage. You know, they did see it. They didn't want to try it that time, but say if it's on a salad bar or something, it's kind of, I find it really important or in, introducing in different ways as well, prepared. So um, that's, that, that, that's I, I definitely see a connection and it, especially our pea shoots are a big thing now. So I've seen a big success from introducing that through farm to, cap, farm to school and into salad bars or into our menu. So it's always kind of like a side dish or something like that. And it's always like one of the first items gone in our salad bar, the pea shoots. So it's definitely a big success there. And um, 
and it's just it, it, it's now like the norm. So it was something that might have been foreign in the beginning and, and, and new, but now is appreciated and enjoyed by a lot. And it's just a, a real treat when you do have it on salad bar. So, but it also it just showcased the variety of what's grown in our valley or what's grown here in Nova Scotia. Just, so just an appreciation. So we have an, a new question in the chat and I'm not sure Indira or Jenny, if you can answer this um, around online ordering, are there photos of the food available for parents to see when ordering? And also are there options for parents to order in another language? Um, no, not that I'm aware of, no. Um, Actually, there's someone online, Food for Thought. I think they're online. Ma yeah, Melissa might yeah, want to chime in on that conversation. But um, they, there is uh, our Facebook page, which so, um, say if we had like our um, burger wars or something, we'd take pictures of those items or show what your child's eating. We did do that in the beginning, but we haven't really done that lately. But that was when we, were, when we first started with the lunch program, we'd post pictures. So Jillian, one of the committee members or someone would come or I take pictures and forward them as one way to kind of advertise the meal and what what it looks like. So. Um, but as for the other question, um, I'll leave that for Melissa. Oh, yeah. OK. Um, and then there was also a question and it just disappeared for me. Uh, oh. People are just wondering about photos or recipes for salad bars, especially the taco or baked potato bar. Maybe, Indira, just talk a little bit more about, yeah, like what, what does a baked potato bar look like? Um, bake, no bacon. <laughs> no bacon. It's just like, <laughs> um, and uh, so basically traditional baked potato, and I think Jenny too could probably, I, I've done it only once. Um, for me, it's, it's for me, the potato bar, is a little harder for me to ex um, execute because of the number and stuff. Just, I found it really hard for me. But when I did do it, um, it was like sour cream, uh, chives, you know, um, so there's hot items. I don't know if, if they did hot items, but you can put chili or something on that. Um, and then what other beans, like a bean salad, uh, cheese. I don't leave cheese. That's one lesson I've learned. I don't put grated cheese or any cheese item on a salad bar because that will go. That would probably be, that would be, so I kind of monitor that and put it in portion cups. So they all do get a, a portion of the cheese, but it's just a little bit more controlled because of the, the expense, that's one expense. And, uh, and it, it's also just in moderation. So just so they're aware, but uh, as a rule, I try to have about nine items on the salad bar. So you kind of have your toppings, like your condiment part of it, but you also have, I always have salad greens. I always have like uh, peppers or a bean or a salad um, of the day. So right now, potato salad is very popular. Um, but uh, but going back to the baked potatoes, pretty much those those common ones, and then maybe throw in some other things like beans or um, uh, like legume black beans or uh, chickpeas or something like that in it. Uh, um, pretty much, I think. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm just uh, wondering if you have any, I guess any other advice for, for a cafeteria where, you know, thinking back to your time in Gasparo. So when you were at Gasparo, smaller school starting out, what, 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 what were the keys to success as you went from like September to December in that in that school um so that was a, a big learning curve for me i think i really learned to streamline and not think i need to you don't need to um you don't need to make everyone happy you're not there you're there to kind of your job is there to provide a meal at lunch and um and keep it basic with favorites and something that's manageable and uh I couldn't have done that probably without the PTA there, the support of the families. Um, at that time, it's, it was a kind of a, a, a growth for me and realizing how long it takes to prepare each item too. So that was a big learning experience there. But I, I, the thing is you can't really do it on your own. You do need to support. 
and um, growing, working in that environment too, there was a lot of uh, farming communities. There's um, families um, that the egg farmer, there's, they donated egg, eggs and stuff like that. So I had items donated there, which was really nice to kind of help out. But uh, I think I lost my train of thought, I'm sorry. No, it's all but, good. Uh, it's, it's, it, it's, it's, one thing is like, we don't we didn't suddenly jump into 300 students it was it's been a growing process and you get them you have to kind of you have to kind of earn your get your audience like you 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 they're not gonna they like jenny was doing with sampling for what a chick about a chicken tastes like i think that's brilliant to kind of because it is challenging to offer one choice to 200 or uh, that number of kids like that and getting used to that one choice every day and getting them to you know to enjoy it and want to have you know and, and, and trusting that you'll 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 create something that they enjoy and tasty and stuff but uh and familiar something familiar as well like that it like spaghetti tastes like spaghetti like there's nothing there's no um i don't really tweet too much in in that one because I want them, there's so much nutritional value in spaghetti, I think, as it is, but uh, in, in especially in the sauce, but it's it's just familiar and, and just keeping things. I'm going off topic now, I think. I don't know where I'm going with this. I don't know, Jenny, help me. <laughs> Actually, Jenny, maybe I'll, I'll ask you when. Jenny, I'll ask you um, another question, which is. In terms of um, editing the menu, can you just talk a little bit more about why it's important to offer choice? Like we've talked about the autonomy in putting in terms of putting putting food on your plate, but that is very different from having a choice of five different meals. So, just why is it important to edit down the number of the number of main meal options? Uh, I think mainly because of the current environment, uh, you know, you, we just don't have infinite hours to cook and yeah, just, just to find a way um, to ensure that you really can meet the volume requirements, because I think what happens and people are often surprised that what happens when you start really focusing on that mean meal and I, anybody who's on here that has, that does this already knows this that there's a lot of there's a lot of excitement and buy in when that meal is is a great meal. And if you are focused on too many um, other options, you just don't have the time in order to uh, to to produce that in the quantities that you need. So I mean, for me, it's um, it can be painful. Like I've been in lots of schools where there were, a, you know, quite a variety and it can be painful at first to tell a kid I'm sorry we don't have your favorite whatever it is um but over time you know you're you're trading out something that isn't working isn't maybe isn't even worth selling like a, for example a lot of recess um recess can take up a lot of time and energy to prepare and organize and it's not really worth it when it comes to the sale yeah. I, I find the and the interruption that it causes was of the schools that I've been at um, do recess anymore. And yeah, we, instead, I guess we are kind of relying on these robust breakfast programs to ensure that, you know, if a kid comes to school and needs a snack, that there'll be an apple or a granola bar or something. Um, and I just wanted to sneak that in there because that I think is something that Indira and I both feel um, is a bit of a key to success is really just focusing on that that may mean much time and making sure that kids with you know special dietary requirements get what they need. Yeah, I think also you kind of extend that idea when it comes to the kitchen table at home. You you kind of you're not given that variety, or maybe I I'm not sure, but usually it's there's a meal of, at, for dinner, and I kind of extend that same idea as well. It, and it, I think the choices um, there's dietary concerns, yes, that you need to accommodate, but I think keeping that main meal of that day it just simplifies in the expectation too of um that's your meal <laughs> you know it's there and um and uh it was ordered for you <laughs> or it's there for you there are some challenges with students that don't receive um 
that basically we we do provide lunches and may not be used to the, the, the variety or you know there, there's an expectation that, that um they're to eat it but they don't want it because they're not used to it for whatever reason those in those individuals we do try to capture and, and um either their teacher or someone will talk to those individuals and they'll write down what they want instead. So we're able to accommodate very basic, like a, a, they wanted just a bagel that day or they just want scrambled eggs. So it's kind of nice. Um, the, there is an expectation, but I, I think we need to, I, for me, I, I realize that those individuals would rather go hungry than eat something they're not familiar with. So it's, but we want to nourish them. So that's kind of nice that we can find, if we do notice that we can accommodate what they're used to as well or what they're familiar and what they'll eat so just on a, a side note no that that's really interesting and i think there's a probably a whole webinar that could be had around how to provide universe like how to ensure that we are providing universal school lunch um and and there was a question in the chat about whether there's any government funding to support um these school meal programs and that that's a, an answer that we could spend a lot of time on and i'm not not sure Jeannie, uh if you're in nova scotia or not but um certainly feel free to reach out to lindsay corbin uh who's with the the nova scotia um chapter on the coalition for healthy school food which has been lobbying for years for canada to not be the only g7 country without uh, a federal investment in school food or a, a, a pan-Canadian uh, school food policy and where we thought we would be getting a little bit closer to that uh, this year and, and we're disappointed at the federal budget. Um, maybe as a as a last question uh, to Jenny and maybe to Jenny and Indira, but we'll start with Jenny and we'll see if we run out of time. Jenny, you've been active in in trying to push for that um, federal investment in school food, what difference would it make if if there was more resource and and where does that where is that resource really needed? Uh, um, <laughs> I think you know the, the reality is that if we had uh, a workforce, our cafeteria workers were, were funded and um, their jobs were secure that we would see a lot of change in the landscape just with that. But also, um, you know, I'm hoping that when we, when we, when we do receive funding, that it, you know, will be accompanied with a bit of a framework for, um, you know, for connecting and for helping cafeteria workers to meet those goals and helping schools to, um, you know, to, to, for every school to be able to pull off a wonderful homemade meal like at KCA that, you know, is reaching so such a high percentage of their of their population. Um, and I have been involved too in like in a pilot of um, what you can here in the valley, um, just as a means of finding out you know, that that's not doesn't mean that it's universal lunch and universal access so kids you know hopefully universal access so that the kids um whose whose families can't necessarily afford to pay full price they're still getting lunch no questions asked no stigma they don't look any different um and you know and, and i can see that participation rates that there's a lot of interest in eating lunch at school when when it's a possibility when it's financially viable so you know when we see a big percentage of the student population all eating the same lunch. It it just changes the whole environment of the school. Suddenly, the cafeteria is, you know, the heartbeat of the school, and their cafeteria worker is an important um, team member. And you know, often I say that that cafeteria worker might be the very favorite adult school of you know many of the students there. So it's another. You know, it's, it's just a way of ensuring that we are able to have this offering at school and that so that kids can eat and learn. And yeah, I I can't believe it's taking this long, but here we are and we're keeping optimistic. So, <laughs> well, that did bring us to two o'clock. So I think I think we'll wrap it there, Jenny. And thank you for, you know, some of those last thoughts. Um, Again, please do consider uh, signing up to follow 
uh, Nourish, you've got all of our, our handles there, but at our website, you can also sign up to our monthly e-newsletter. We were just editing the one for June. Uh, so if you sign up today, you'll get it uh, very shortly. And we also have there the, the handles for the Coalition for Healthy School Food, which has set eight guiding principles for what an, uh, what a cost-shared school food program for Canada should look like. Um, and uh, thank you, thank you all so much for joining. We had 34 people on right at the moment. We had more than 50 registered. And so I hope that some folks will be watching this later on our YouTube channel. And um, I think I think that's all. Indira and Jenny, thank you so much. I'm, it's always exciting to hear about the work that you're involved with. And I, I hope that by inviting you to this webinar, more folks are inspired um, and, and have some tools to follow you on your, on your journeys. Thank you so much. And thanks to everybody uh, chiming in on the chat. Uh, I see some wonderful, I see some offers of various sorts in the chat. And if anybody has a hard time connecting with someone or with a, with a resource, um, you know, feel free to reach out to Nourish and we'll help you to connect. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.